Good evening. Welcome everyone to our evening with Henry Erbach talking about the Philip Johnson Glass House. It looks like we have yet another capacity crowd here in the library. This is getting really exciting. Every event we have is filling our spaces or the spaces that we are using elsewhere in town. And it's tremendous to see so many people coming out for all of these various incredible programs that we're putting on. On Friday night, we had <coughs> Nathaniel Philbrick, who came to talk about In the Heart of the Sea as the culminating event for our One Town Read. We had 650 people there that, uh, the other night. We looks like we've got about over 200 people here tonight, um, which is phenomenal on a Sunday evening when it's fine outside. Thanks, Henry. You're obviously a good attractant. Um, look, I won't keep you too much longer. I'll just talk to you a little bit about Henry, the director of the Glass House since April 2012. Before he came to us here in New Canaan, he was curator of architecture and design at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And before that, he had his own gallery of contemporary art and architecture in New York. With multiple advanced degrees in architecture and history of architecture from Columbia and Princeton, He's taught architecture at UCLA and Yale universities, and now has come to us to run the glass house and provide that catalyst for understanding and education of the modern architecture movement and so much more. Thank you very much, Henry, for being with us tonight, and welcome. Thank you, Lisa, very much for such a, a nice introduction and welcome. And thank you all for coming out on uh, this very um, uh, much needed spring afternoon after uh, such a long winter here. Um, how many of you have been to the Glass House? How, how many of you have not been to the Glass House? OK, so it's about half and half. Hopefully this talk will uh, entice those of you who haven't been to, uh, to visit and, and others to come back. Um, I, I actually just completed a, a speaking tour about the Glass House in Europe a couple of weeks ago in uh, the Netherlands, Germany, uh, and the Czech Republic. And, uh, and it's nice to come home, in a way, at the end of this tour to New Canaan, all of which is to say that the Glass House is uh, simultaneously rooted here in New Canaan, where a very specific set of um, cultural and historical conditions came together to make possible the amazing heritage of modern architecture that exists here. Um, and at the same time, it's a site of national and international significance. Uh, we're part of the National Trust for Historic Preservation, which operates about 25 sites around the country, all of major national significance. And, um, and the Glass House is known uh, internationally, and we receive visitors from most countries uh, in the world, uh, many groups of architecture students from Japan and Germany and Switzerland. And, um, and, and so it's really, um, I think, a very special site insofar as it's, um, it has this extraordinary reach, and yet it is right here in New Canaan. What I thought I would do today is speak about the history of the Glass House and some, some themes that I find quite interesting, and also to give you a sense of what we've been doing with the Glass House uh, since I arrived two years ago. Um, and I will say it's really a pleasure to see uh, so many familiar faces in the audience, um, not only people who I've had the chance to meet in, in town since I moved here, but also um, members of our staff and advisory council and many members of our uh, incredible guide team uh, who are really the ambassadors for the Glass House for the roughly 13,000 visitors each year that we, that we welcome. So thank you all. Uh, the Glass House was completed in 1949 by Philip Johnson who uh, at that point had just begun to establish himself as an architect, and he built it as his own home, as a kind of weekend retreat, um, and um, actually commissioned many of the most uh, important photographers of the day 
uh, this Arnold Newman photograph among them, to represent the house, which became uh, an instant uh, icon in media uh, published in the New York Times and many other important publications within a few months. It was really a groundbreaking structure. It was the first, uh, the first building to be faced entirely in large sheets of plate glass. And this was a dream of the modern movement to create a kind of seamless transparency uh, between inside and outside. And in fact, it was a project that uh, Philip's mentor and collaborator, Mies van der Rohe, was working on. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but Philip was really the first to, uh, to complete this, this work, which was kind of, uh, if you will, the realization of a dream that had been developing for about a half century through the modern movement. Um, Philip actually began his career as a curator and was the world's first curator of architecture and design. He essentially invented the discipline. Um, with this groundbreaking exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art, in 1932 that came to be known as the International Style Show, which brought European modernism to America. Uh, he went on to do a number of very important exhibitions at MoMA, including this one with Mies van der Rohe in the late 1940s, uh, the Machine Art Exhibition, which was the first museum exhibition to consider uh, industrially designed objects as works of art. And in the same year that the glass house was completed, um, this uh, house by Marcel Breuer, which was built in the garden uh, at the Museum of Modern Art. And of course, Marcel Breuer, one of the Harvard Five, a uh, key figure in the development of modernism in New Canaan. The site is on Ponis Ridge Road and was originally about five acres. This is a plan uh, that showed a drive coming diagonally down the site to a little parking area. Number three is the brick house <coughs> and number five is the glass house. And these two buildings were completed at about the same time and very much thought of as a pair. Um, you might actually think of them as a single building that's been split in two. They're about the same size. One is completely transparent, the other is almost completely opaque. Uh, and together they combine the various functions of, of a house uh, with the brick house sheltering the more private uh, aspects and the glass house more of a kind of uh, pavilion for uh, entertaining and Indeed, there is a bed and a kitchen, um, but the two really work as uh, complementary parts of a whole. Uh, this is an early photograph of the glass house interior. As, as those of you who have been know, it hasn't changed very much. Uh, that's quite interesting because almost everything else at the glass house has changed tremendously over uh, the decades since this building was complete. And yet the interior of the glass house itself remained uh, kind of pure and static, if you will. Uh, the candelabra is no longer there. It was replaced by a different kind of lighting element. But essentially, this is how it still looks. Um, over the course of a few decades, uh, Philip Johnson and eventually his partner, uh, David Whitney, began to acquire uh, adjacent sites so that the campus is now about 49 acres. Uh, and they, they acquired them over many years. And as they did so, uh, began to develop a concept for something that is much more like a, a park, really, or an estate um, with different built elements. Um, as I mentioned, almost everything uh, about the glass house except its own interior began to transform, and rather quickly. Um, uh, Philip Johnson was a famously restless architect. Um, he is perhaps the architect uh, who can least be identified with a single style. He tried on many, many different uh, styles, languages, ways of working with architecture over the course of his career, eventually becoming one of the leaders of American postmodernism, deconstructivism. And that uh, kind of spirit of tinkering really began here 
in the interior of the brick house, which was transformed from a more modernist space into something like a kind of pared down Rococo, where um, a, a kind of delicate canopy of plaster vaults uh, was placed over the room. The walls were lined in a Fortuny wallpaper uh, in a medieval Persian pattern uh, in a kind of salmon and gold color. And uh, one of the very earliest uses of indirect lighting on a dimmer switch so that there was a kind of um, still pared down but magical and sensual quality uh, to this, this bedroom <coughs> in the guest house. Um, a few years later, they, uh, Philip removed the sculpture that had sat where the pool would eventually be built and, and added the swimming pool. And as I say, began to conceive of the campus as a kind of park and a place for pleasure and entertaining. Um, in addition, the landscape was cleared. Uh, as all of you know, uh, there aren't many properties in New Canaan that have this kind of openness. It's a heavily wooded area. And, um, and this project of landscape transformation is one that began early and was continuous through the life of the glass house um, until both Philip and David passed away in 2005. Um, and, and the idea was really to return the site, if you will, to a kind of uh, almost 18th century agrarian landscape um, the effect of which is certainly heightened by the, the dry stone walls that are, that are typical of this area, um, but also in a way to create a clearing uh, in which the various buildings and eventually outdoor artworks uh, could be set. Um, and as well to recall something of Johnson's childhood uh, growing up outside of Cleveland, Ohio in this kind of landscape. And there are actually many autobiographical elements uh, at the glass house. There are trees that he named for his parents, for example. Um, there are numerous references to different parts of his life and uh, friendships that he had. And so um, one of the interesting things about the transformation of the glass house from a private residence to a public site, uh, and we opened to the public in 2007, um, is um, the way in which it retains something that is really deeply personal uh, and even very quirky um, about Philip Johnson and yet also has this kind of uh, public status that we've been cultivating. Um, in 1962, in what we now call the lower landscape, uh, a pond was created and a pond pavilion built. Um, this pavilion is uh, odd in a number of ways. It's, um, it's smaller and lower than uh, you would expect. The height of the ceiling is about five foot eight, so you just have to duck to enter. Um, that had the effect of increasing the, uh, the appearance of scale from the house itself, um, but also creates a very special experience when you're down there, especially when you're sitting um, which is often how it was used as a place for picnics and, and so on. Um, this is an early view um, of the pond and pavilion when the fountain was running. Um, it actually only ran for a few years and it was about 120 feet high, so it reached the very height of the glass house. And um, this is one of many restoration projects um, on, on site that we're uh, hoping to achieve over the next few years, and I'll talk a bit more about that. Um, in, uh, in 1965, um, well, I should say in 1960, Philip met David Whitney, and uh, David was a young and uh, aspiring collector, curator, uh, editor, very much interested in contemporary art, and together they began to develop um, what became a very significant uh, collection of modern art. Uh, so in 1965, they built this structure, which is the painting gallery. Um, Philip called it the Kunstbunker, the, um, the art bunker, um, as it's uh, an underground berm structure. Um, and this is an Arnold Newman photograph from, uh, from the late 60s where you see um, some very important works of art, Jasper John's flag, there's uh, Rothko, uh, and Philip, uh, as, as he would 
speaking with small groups uh, about the works on display. There are these, um, uh, it's a, there's a system of hanging panels. There are um, three of them in different sizes and each has two panels that allow a single canvas to be displayed and then rotated uh, so that it's really a, a very unusual system for displaying and storing art that suggests the way in which the gallery was really um, also not fixed, that there was a kind of uh, mutability and even a kind of restlessness to it. And uh, in fact, Philip and David remain the single largest donors uh, to the Museum of Modern Art with uh, well more than a thousand uh, objects donated to MoMA's collection and about two dozen or so of, uh, of their paintings and roughly the same number of sculptures remain with us uh, at the Glass House and those were works that Philip selected to be uh, part of our permanent collection. This is the painting gallery uh, as it appears now. Um, <coughs> it's very much part of our uh, visitor's experience. We, as I mentioned, we, met, we welcome about 13,000 visitors a year. Um, that's actually a limit that has to do with our operating permit. We're in a residential neighborhood and so there are uh, parameters to uh, times of year, times of day, numbers of people that we can have on the site. Um, our, our visitors explore uh, these various buildings uh, as well as the landscape and art collection and we also do special events uh, in a number of locations on the site including the painting gallery. Uh, this is one of our prize works, a portrait of Philip by Andy Warhol. And then um, five years later, uh, they, they had been displaying sculpture in the painting gallery, but their collection was growing and there started to be sort of a, a tension between uh, large works on pedestals and these hanging panels. So they built a separate building that is the sculpture gallery. Uh, which you see here, it's a largely solid building with an enormous um, canted roof made of glass that uh, produces a very special light inside and uh, often when there's sun, very strong striped shadows. Uh, this is how the gallery appears now um, with uh, Robert Morris' work on the floor, uh, George Siegel bed, there are uh, essentially five platforms and the concept for the building was, uh, and again, as I, as I mentioned, Philip was, um, was famously restless in, in how he thought about um, uh, making architecture and at the glass house itself, you see this kind of constant experimentation with different ways of, uh, of making a building. Um, this one pays uh, homage to uh, sort of Mediterranean or Greek villages uh, kind of whitewashed stucco and a really special kind of uh, spiraling sequence down that allows you to see the whole but then concentrate on, on individual works. Um, this is an amazing <coughs> Frank Stella sculpture uh, called The Raft of the Medusa after the Jericho uh, painting and a very important early Bruce Nauman work uh, that we have on display as well. Um, as the, uh, as the estate or campus grew, uh, additional structures and buildings, pavilions were made. Uh, here the entrance gate, which was added in 1977. Uh, it has a distinctly kind of postmodern, uh, almost Egyptian feeling. Um, the the uh, gate itself is uh, a uh, rig, a kind of uh, hollow s aluminum tube uh, that goes up and down. And um, it also has a kind of uh, melancholy quality that, that we see in various places through the site. Uh, later, a library study was added. It's a single room where Philip would go to work. He uh, spoke of the experience of trying to work in the glass house, uh, which he did for many years, as ultimately too distracting. Um, um, the, uh, the presence of nature, changing light, the wildlife we have on the site. And so uh, here he created um, essentially a very solid building uh, where he could go and concentrate. And this is where his library of books on architecture uh, are still housed. And here you see the interior. 
uh, there's a kind of uh, Oculus uh, skylight over the desk, as well as um, a number of, uh, a collection of, of really very important books on architecture, the history of architecture, uh, landscape, and other topics that were um, very much part of Philip's uh, working method um, as he, in a sense, uh, mined or referenced uh, the history of architecture to develop contemporary reinterpretations of earlier forms. There is one window in the library, a large window that looks out to a building called the Ghost House, uh, which you'll see in a minute. There are also a number of older structures on the site. There are three houses. Uh, this is uh, the house that David Whitney lived in that is now the director's house, my house, uh, known as Kaluna Farms. Uh, and um, with, uh, with all of these older structures, uh, Philip and David also tinkered with them to, in a way, simplify them and make them more abstract, more iconic, uh, if you will. Um, so really, everything about the site, uh, even the old structures, even the way that the existing stone walls um, were, were cultivated, and certainly the landscape itself, was constantly being reworked and refined uh, so that a sort of total concept of place uh, could be as, as perfectly realized as, as possible. Um, this is a garden, <coughs> a succulent garden that is next to the house. Um, it uh, is faced in granite from one of Philip's uh, most important um, tall buildings, the AT&T building. And the form of the garden is based on a Malevich drawing that uh, they had acquired that hung in the bedroom upstairs so that you could look at the drawing and at the garden and see this relationship. And uh, here, as in so many places on the site, there is this kind of correspondence between uh, aesthetic phenomena, the way an artwork is made, and the way that nature is remade. Uh, in summer, the succulents grow quite tall here. Uh, it's a very strange and, and beautiful garden. And uh, this is the ghost house that I mentioned, uh, which is also a very strange and, and beautiful uh, element on the site. It's made of uh, expanded metal, um, it was an homage to uh, a number of different works of architecture. First of all, to uh, Frank Gehry, who was a friend of Philip Johnson's and one of uh, several important protégés. Um, Johnson was uh, very, very active in cultivating the careers of younger architects, including Robert Stern, Charles Guafney, Peter Eisenman, uh, Frank Gehry. And, um, and Gary had done a house for himself in Santa Monica that used this material. Uh, but in addition, there were um, ghost structures by Robert Venturi uh, in Philadelphia that this made reference to. And uh, Philip was always very coy about these references. We'll, we'll talk more about that in a moment. But um, typically, um, an element refers not just to one thing, but to, to many elements. And, really reflects the kind of uh, erudition as well as playfulness that he brought to uh, the way he made architecture, certainly at the Glass House and also for other clients. Um, later, he built uh, another uh, kind of folly, if you will. This is a sculpture that you climb on. Um, well, actually, we don't climb on it anymore, but it was, <laughs> uh, it was built for climbing, and it was built as uh, a birthday present for uh, Philip's friend, Lincoln Kirstein, who was co-founder of City Ballet on the occasion of his 80th birthday. And uh, Philip felt that uh, Kirstein hadn't quite received the, the due or recognition that, that he would have liked, so, uh, so he built this, uh, this tower for him. And that goes back to the way in which, um, as I mentioned, there are kind of autobiographical elements, very personal elements uh, sprinkled across the site. Uh, here you see the relationship of the tower to uh, the pond and the pavilion and the lower landscape and the forest beyond. And uh, it's maybe not so clear in this image, but even the forest was uh, kind of masterminded, if you will, with uh, undergrowth removed and kind of alleys cut into it to increase the sense of perspective from the house on the promontory. And Philip and David would uh, sit in 
uh, Bertoia chairs behind the glass house with walkie-talkies and speak to the landscapers uh, out, in, out in the forest, suggesting how they might trim different elements. So um, a very high degree of fussiness that we all benefit from. Uh, this is another one of the older structures on the site that was very much modified. It had been a much larger house. It was reduced to this kind of uh, perfect salt box um, shape uh, with an etched glass window by Michael Heiser and a beautiful garden at the back that, well, this year it'll probably be a little bit late, but should bloom sometime in May with um, an incredible collection of uh, peonies and irises. Uh, the very last large structure to be built on the site is this building known as De Monsta. It was completed in 1995. In 1992, there, uh, there was an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art on deconstructivist architecture, which was, um, if you will, the vogue of the day. And Philip was actually co-curator of that exhibition, always kind of keeping uh, an eye on and a hand in um, what was the latest development in architecture. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, this building was intended as a visitor center as Philip was preparing the site for, um, for uh, transformation into a public site. But um <coughs> as the agreement with the town of New Canaan developed, a decision was made that Visitors would arrive in town, so as many of you know, we have our visitor center and design store at 199 Elm Street, where people arrive and then take a shuttle, shuttle van to the site. Uh, and this building actually sat empty uh, until I arrived here two years ago. And here you see the relationship of the library and De Monsta in the landscape. And um, you know, the landscape is really, I think, one of um, the most magical qualities uh, of the glass house. And it's also a kind of constantly changing one uh, insofar as there's a very precise schedule for uh, mowing high grass so that over the course of each season, there's a kind of constantly changing relationship between uh, wild and uh, very refined. Uh, with the lawn between the glass house and the brick house being the most kind of pristine and immaculate of all. The very last structure to be built um, was Dog House uh, in 2002 um, for Alice and James, uh, their, uh, their beloved dogs. And um, uh, the dogs didn't like to go in the house very much, um, <laughs> but they did like to leave their bones in there, as you see. Um, and so it became a kind of uh, ossuary, if you will. Um, and I will say that I had the privilege of meeting Philip Johnson in 2001 during the period when I had my gallery in New York. And as I was uh, a young person in the field doing something interesting, Philip wanted to know about it, and so uh, invited me up to the glass house, which for me was uh, really an incredible uh, privilege and honor. I had known about it, you know, since I, even before I began my studies in architecture, and, um, and I'm very grateful uh, to have met him then. Of course, there was no way I could know that eventually I would return here as director um, and, um, and now we'll talk a little bit about the way the glass house sort of functioned uh, before it became a public site. It was really a place where Philip would come to unwind, um, always maintaining uh, an office and, um, and residence in New York, but this was very much a kind of weekend retreat. Uh, and this wonderful photograph of a uh, kind of picnic lunch uh, down in the pavilion, on tatami mats. Uh, in its day, the pavilion had a gold lame uh, ceiling, uh, as well as um, beautiful gurgling fountains. So again, a kind of very sensual, um, uh, in a way extravagant, and yet still uh, quite modest uh, approach to uh, developing spaces for entertaining. And I will say that's another quality that I find very interesting about the glass house, that on the one hand, it's almost unbelievably extravagant, and on the other, it's actually very modest and in some ways quite austere. Um, and 
I think that uh, that's part of what gives it a kind of uh, abiding interest. Um, as the, the um, kind of life of the glass house developed, especially in the 1960s and 70s, it became a very important gathering place or salon for uh, leading architects, artists, uh, philanthropists, a real kind of magnetic center um, that uh, architectural historian Vincent Scully has called the most sustained cultural salon the United States ever saw. And here in this photograph, you see uh, the young Robert Stern, uh, Philip Johnson with his friend and eye doctor, David Whitney, and Andy Warhol, who uh, spent quite a bit of time here uh, in the 1960s. Uh, and there you see a photograph of Andy in bed in the brick house with, uh, with David Whitney uh, peeking out the window. Uh, there were also many important society gatherings. Uh, there was a, a so-called country happening in 1967 that was a benefit for the Merce Cunningham Dance Company. Uh, Lou Reed and the Velvet Underground performed there. Um, it was uh, one of the most notable events of the year, covered in Vogue magazine. Uh, and here you see uh, Philip with his uh, eventual client and friend, John de Menil, um, uh, one of the uh, most important uh, philanthropists and collectors uh, in America, uh, and very much part of the, the kind of glass house orbit. And here you see the Vogue coverage of the, the country happening. Um, the Glass House can also be thought of as a kind of laboratory that Philip used to investigate ways of making architecture that he would uh, then take elsewhere. And so if you think of the Glass House and the Brick House combined, uh, what you have is the Rockefeller Guest House uh, built in, in Midtown for the Rockefeller family on the left, as well as the Wiley House here in New Canaan uh, with a transparent glass box uh, situated on a masonry base. Uh, or here, where you have uh, on the right the, uh, the lake pavilion, and here you have a nice view of the, um, the fountains that existed um, uh, 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 earlier on in its life, uh, and the uh, Beck House in Dallas, um, also the New York State Theater by Philip Johnson, uh, took its cue from uh, this early experiment at the lake pavilion. Uh, I had mentioned uh, the um, the plaster canopy ceiling of the brick house interior, that was reiterated in a different way at a house in Texas as well. Uh, and the uh, entrance to the painting gallery became uh, the way you approach the Geyer house. And the sculpture gallery interior, the Fort Worth water garden. And de Monsta became the Cathedral of Hope. And again, there are um, more than these single examples that I could give, but really just a way of saying that, um, you know, Philip, he spoke about the glass house as a kind of diary, if you will, really a kind of sketchbook or a place for tinkering with ideas that he would then take out into the world uh, working with other clients. Um, but at the same time, the world uh, was being brought into the glass house. And uh, this is just to give you a sense of some of the important influences on the structures that were built here in New Canaan. Uh, on the right, of course, the glass house itself. And on the left is the Farnsworth House by Mies van der Rohe, which was on the drawing boards uh, in Mies's office when Philip began to conceive of the glass house. And he quite openly acknowledged uh, his, his debt or his homage to Mies, who was uh, really his great uh, mentor and, and master, if you will. Um, uh, Philip beat him to the punch by three years. Um, but also they're very different buildings. Um, uh, clearly there, there are important similarities, and yet uh, the Farnsworth is more, um, more aligned with the principles of European modernism, uh, insofar as it floats off the ground uh, and that it conveys a kind of universal or horizontal space that extends infinitely uh, along with other elements, whereas Philip's project is really much more American, if you will, and kind of rooted uh, in its place and even anchored by, um, by the cylindrical 
uh, brick hearth um, that uh, pierces the roof of the pavilion. Um, one of the very odd and interesting things that Philip did soon after completing the glass house was um, uh, write an article for Architectural Review magazine in 1950 in which he acknowledged many different historical sources uh, for the glass house and, and the brick house and the relationship between them. This was very unusual for an architect of, of the day. Uh, modern architecture, especially in that period, was very much um, about advocating a kind of uh, lean approach to uh, technology, to climate, a direct connection with site, function was very important. And so for Philip to bring history into the equation um, was quite a radical move, but even more so because of the range of sources, some of which were properly architectural, um, and others were paintings um, or uh, landscapes. Some were, um, there's reference to a kind of farm village. Uh, and so very early on demonstrating, uh, again, this kind of tremendous erudition, but also appetite um, uh, for knowledge and a way of using that knowledge and condensing that into a single idea. Uh, another possible source for the glass house itself is uh, the screened-in porch that Walter Gropius had in Lincoln, Massachusetts. Gropius was dean at the Harvard uh, Graduate School of Design where Philip did his architecture degree and surely would have spent some time there. Um, the brick house interior is uh, a very direct reference to the breakfast room of the Sir John Soane House in London. Uh, Sir John Soane was uh, an 18th century architect uh, who Philip admired greatly, uh, not only because of the quality of his architecture, um, but also I think because of the role of, of history and his passion as a collector, uh, such that the John Soane House has developed into an extraordinary museum of architectural fragments, bits of antiquity, um, that are um, combined in a way that is extraordinarily dense. And so um, I, th I, I believe there was a kind of identification that Philip shared with, with Soane, uh, his passion for history and collecting, and, uh, and that became um, registered on the site uh, with this reference. Uh, the Pond Pavilion, one of the many references is a painting by Robert Delaunay of uh, Saint Severin. Uh, but Philip also spoke about the mosque in Cordoba and uh, various uh, islands that were developed in Renaissance gardens. And the painting gallery, and I have to say I'm a little nervous speaking in front of so many of our guides who, um, <laughs> who I, um, I know um, really have all of these facts at their fingertips all the time. Um, but I, um, nonetheless, um, so the, uh, the painting gallery uh, is a very direct reference to uh, the tomb of Atreus in Mycenae from 1250 uh, BC. And um, in addition to the other two uh, references that I mentioned earlier, the Frank Gehry House and the Venturi and Scott Brown uh, ghost structures, um, the ghost house is also a reference to a house that Robert Venturi did for his mother, which was one of the single signal works of postmodernism with uh, a kind of deeply split pediment. Uh, and as well, the Lincoln Kirstein Tower, which used to be uh, an unpainted cinder block, as you see here, uh, likely a reference to Tatlin's monument to the Third International. And de Monsta also has uh, many sources of inspiration and reference, but the one that's most direct is uh, this project by Frank Stella, uh, an artist who Philip and David developed an extremely close relationship with and who remains uh, well represented in our collection. And this was a project that Stella did for a Kunsthall um, in Germany outside of Dresden that was unbuilt. And so he gave the model to Philip and said, here, why don't you build it? And, and Philip did. So um, 
as I mentioned, the site opened to the public in 2007, and, um, and there were many important transformations that were undertaken by my predecessor, Christine Clear, who was um, the first director here at the Glass House, and her team, I know that Marty is here in the audience. A uh, tremendous amount of work was done to uh, transform the site into one that could accept the public um, in, in, in many ways. And this map was prepared, and now you see all of the elements that we discussed. Um, So ultimately what you have is the glass house as a kind of uh, center around which all of these other elements, all of these pavilions and buildings and follies, uh, all of these other um, kind of explorations uh, revolve. And in a way, um, just as I, s as I mentioned earlier, the glass house and brick house can be thought of as one house split in two. Now, really, the entire campus can be thought of as a single house kind of fragmented into multiple elements that combined add up to, uh, to everything that this place is and, and needs. Um, one of the very important things that we do at the Glass House is undertake preservation projects of different scales. Uh, there were quite a few done before I arrived, and this was one that we were able to do last summer. Um, and uh, it was a project to replace the 50-year-old roof of our painting gallery, which, uh, which had reached the end of its, uh, its life. And this was a project that we completed in a few months, uh, on time, under budget. Uh, our neighbors were very uh, patient with us uh, as, we, as we did this important work, but it was really essential to uh, preserve the integrity of, of the building and the um, extremely valuable uh, uh, art collection that it houses. Um, one of the things that I've done since arriving is uh, really try to reactivate the glass house, to um, look back toward uh, its legacy as a kind of salon, a place for new art and ideas, uh, a place where things change, um, and, and in this sense to take a historic site and to on the one hand, allow it to remain as uh, kind of pure uh, as, as it can be, and at the same time to infuse it with, with new life. And we've done that in a number of different ways, uh, exhibitions and public programs among them. And this was really the first exhibition that we did, which uh, was proposed to us by a guest curator, Jordan Stein, and is actually a three and a half year project that is ongoing uh, this season. And the idea was that um, there used to be a sculpture by Giacometti uh, that you see on the left that sat on the Mies van der Rohe coffee table in the glass house. And in the 1960s, uh, this sculpture, which was uh, plaster, not a bronze, um, had decayed so much so that it had to be sent back to the studio for repair. Uh, Giacometti died soon after that, and then we don't know what happened, but. Uh, Philip and David seemed to have lost track of it, and uh, nothing was done, and the sculpture was never returned. So it marked a kind of absence, um, and this concept of, of absence is a very interesting one at a historic site, because, um, of course, this was uh, built as a place to house and accommodate the lives of, of people, and once those people uh, are gone, you are dealing with uh, certainly a kind of disappearance or absence or at times ghosts, uh, we think. Um, but this became a very interesting way of registering that um, disappearance and trying to make it present. And so what we do is twice each season, we bring in another sculpture. Uh, on the right, you see the first one by Ken Price, who is an artist that, uh, that Philip and David were interested in, David really championed his work, and then this sculpture too disappears and makes way for the next one. So it's a kind of uh, ongoing series of uh, disappearing acts, if you will. Um, the next 
exhibition project really, or I should say the next curatorial project was to activate the uh, building called De Monsta, which as I said had sat empty since uh, 1995 when it was complete. And we began to use it as a gallery for showing contemporary art. The first exhibition was recent sculpture by Frank Stella, which made a lot of sense because uh, of how important Stella is to our collection, but also as I, as I said, because of um, the profound influence of Stella's work on the design of the building itself. And the second project last season was our first kind of um, site-specific installation, a uh, work called Snap by Evie Day, uh, where we invited Evie to interpret the building. And she became interested in the sort of animus, the kind of life spirit of this building that was after all called a monster, um, and became interested in kind of tackling it or uh, channeling that energy and containing it. Um, so here this um, uh, quite wonderful uh, project uh, by, by Evie. And then last fall, um, we had, I guess, um, what is really our first exhibition by an architect, um, Alex Schwader, who drove up to the site in a van, uh, out of which popped an inflatable room. It went 30 feet in the air, <laughs> and he lived in it for two weeks. Um, and while he was on the site, uh, was working on his dissertation, he's um, getting a doctorate at Cambridge, uh, um, focused on the relationship between performance and architecture and found some uh, books in, in Philip's library that were, that were really important to him. And for us, this was, uh, again, not only part of kind of activating the site and allowing it to live as a place of experimentation um, and a place where kind of new ideas can be developed and tested, but also as a pilot for a possible artist in residency uh, program that could develop as at the Glass House. And we actually learned a great deal about what it means to have an artist living on site for a couple of weeks through this project. Um, this is a preview of our next exhibition. Uh, we're working with the Japanese artist Fujiko Nakaya, uh, who is uh, coming to New Canaan in two weeks to install a work called Veil that will shroud the glass house in mist, in a cloud, um, for about 10 minutes every hour. So um, this house, which um, in a way has always dreamed of vanishing into the landscape, uh, actually will disappear. Um, and it will be uh, a way of kind of underscoring and dramatizing that, that I think will be really an extraordinary uh, experience for our visitors, and I hope uh, all of you will, will come to the Glass House this season uh, to see it. Uh, this is, um, just to give you a little background on Nakaya, this is a children's park that she did in Tokyo, uh, where the landscape is kind of infused with these uh, waves of, uh, of vapor and mist. Uh, we also do many public programs at the Glass House. Um, I hope some of you have come to our conversations and context uh, where we bring uh, distinguished leaders in uh, the arts, architecture, design, different fields um, in a kind of very intimate setting, uh, whether it's outside on the lawn or uh, in the glass house or the painting gallery. And um, we also started doing readings last season. This is Daniel Mendelssohn, who's a noted um, essayist, scholar, uh, writes for The New Yorker, uh, translator of Kavafi um, and uh, gave a reading from a new book that he's working on about retracing the steps of the Odyssey with his father. Uh, and that was really a very special uh, afternoon. Um, we've also started doing small performances and um, we do them uh, on the occasion of each rotation of a sculpture in the project called Night that I mentioned earlier. And uh, this was the very first Night Sounds with Juliana Barwick performing inside the glass house on a very cold uh, late November night. And it was really uh, magical. 
Uh, a number of artists, uh, very important artists, come to the Glass House. We, uh, we have tremendous interest, actually, in artists who want to come here and make projects, photograph the site. Uh, here you see a photograph by Hiroshi Sugimoto, one of the uh, most important uh, contemporary photographers uh, who made this wonderful benefit edition uh, for us and is actually returning to the site uh, next month uh, to explore it further. And um, James Welling, uh, another uh, very important uh, contemporary artist, uh, has made a beautiful series of photographs of the glass house using color in a very uh, strong and abstract way and uh, has also been generous with us uh, in terms of providing um, edition prints uh, that we can use for fundraising. And here you see four small wellings. And these are all on display in our design store. And this is a view of our design store, which we transformed last year uh, from something that was more like a small museum shop with uh, many, many, many different kinds of products into something much more consistent with the glass house itself and our visitors' experience. So uh, we worked with the uh, design uh, retailer Murray Moss, who had a wonderful design store in Soho for many years, and uh, he helped us reconceive the shop as something um, in a way much more related to, uh, you'll recall the early slide of the machine art exhibition that Philip Johnson did, where industrial objects could be um, kind of um, presented in a very, very refined uh, and intense way. Uh, and I will say that though small, I think we now have one of the best design stores in the country. And uh, if you haven't been, please come. We also have an online store uh, and there are many pieces here that you really can't find anywhere else, as well as some great uh, iconic classic objects. Um, we also do uh, an annual fundraising event. It's called our Summer Party, and this year it will be on June 14th. Uh, so you're seeing some images from last year's Summer Party, which is a really festive, uh, wonderful day. We have a beautiful picnic lunch that Elm provides. Uh, we have live music, we have lawn games, uh, silent auction with uh, really terrific works by uh, many different artists and experiences that we auction off. Um, we have about uh, 200, 250 people on site. It tends to sell out uh, well in advance, so um, I encourage uh, all of you to come and uh, please visit our website, uh, glasshouse.org, uh, for tickets, as well as information about our public programs. We have uh, the important landscape architect, Edwina Van Gaal, speaking with Maya Lin on May 18th, uh, as well as um, the architect, David Adjay, speaking with curator Thelma Golden on June 8th, I believe. Um, and a really exciting uh, set of public programs coming up this season. Thank you very much. We, we, I think we have some time, and I would be delighted for any questions you have. Yes, the three older buildings were there as he acquired the land, and all of the new structures were designed by, by Philip. Yeah, the brick house has been closed since 2008. Uh, it reopened, uh, it opened to the public when the site opened in 2007, and then it turned out that there was some pretty serious water infiltration. Um, we are uh, actively raising funds. It's, uh, it's not an inexpensive project. Um, it's estimated to be between, excuse me, <coughs> between, thank you, uh, one and a half and two million dollar project. Um, and we have some uh, initial uh, corporate interest. Um, but there are a number of very important preservation projects before us on the site. 
the sculpture gallery roof is in need of repair. Uh, it's actually leaking. Um, the, uh, the pond and the pond pavilion uh, also need work. Even the glass house needs some work. Uh, we are fortunate that we were able to complete the painting gallery roof, which was the most urgent uh, project last season. And as funds become available, we're moving uh, as efficiently as we can. Ultimately, uh, of course, it's our, our great hope to reopen the brick house. Uh, it's a very important part of the site and ultimately the visitor experience. And uh, we hope to get there soon. There, there is a bedroom in the brick house. Uh, there's also a bed in the glass house. And it appears that uh, Philip would choose where, where he would sleep. Um, the brick house uh, had air conditioning, whereas the glass house uh, never did. Uh, that too is a dream. Um, <laughs> we very much would like to do that. Um, it's, uh, that can't be our first priority, but uh, it is something that we hope to get to. It's single pane. Uh, uh, it's, it's, I think, Marty? <laughs> Quarter inch plate. The Farnsworth House is not in New Canaan. It's it's in Illinois. It's in uh, it's outside of Chicago. Th that that is the Mies van der Rohe House. There there is no Mies van der Rohe House in New Canaan. There. Uh, not uh, not in the sense of this glass house. I showed the Wiley House, which is the glass box on the masonry base. That that is in New Canaan, and that was Philip Johnson and. There are other Johnson houses that use quite a bit of glass, but none that is uh, entirely faced in glass. Yes. Yes. Yes, he did. Yeah, Philip uh, discovered that as, uh, as the sun set and it became dark, that um, the interior became very reflective. He would just see himself uh, in, in reflected in the glass. And so he began to work with Richard Kelly, who uh, became really the preeminent um, lighting designer of uh, many modernist buildings, including the Seagram uh, building. Um, and developed a, a system of lighting the, uh, the canopy of the trees, the underside, uh, so that it would create the proper balance of light between inside and out. And the inside of the glass house remains quite dim at night, actually. Um, so, yeah. Are the buildings in any way connected to what goes on in the city? What is happening to the house? Are the buildings, for example, fixed? Well, the brick and the glass house actually are connected, but not for not for passage. There's um, there's a kind of uh, chase or umbilical cord, if you will, that carries uh, mechanical uh, heat and even telephone wiring from the brick house, where that's all centered, to the glass house, so that the glass house could be freed of those systems. Um, but uh, all all passage between buildings is at ground level. And uh, Philip liked that idea very much. And in fact, when the site reopened to the public, a number of paths were added so that it would be, be more uh, safe and suitable for uh, public tours. Uh, but, but Philip was, um, in his day, much more interested in kind of wandering through, uh, through the landscape, through the fields, uh, to get from one place to another. And I think very much liked the, the challenge that, uh, that the weather uh, here poses. Uh, <laughs> 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 
he did. He did. And there are some uh, famous uh, exchanges that, that took place. Uh, Wright asked whether he should keep his hat on or take it off when he entered the house. Was he indoors or outdoors? And uh, there, there were some debates about the placement of um, the large sculpture by Ellie Nottleman. Um, so, um, but they had a kind of long and contentious history, uh, Philip and, uh, and Frank Lloyd Wright, beginning with the 1932 exhibition and um, certainly continuing through, uh, through their careers. Oh, that's very nice. Thank it's always very exciting. Uh, you know, I keep going back again and again. I always learn more. Th thank you very much. Yeah, we started doing that last year. It's our community day. Uh, this year we have one on May 7th that I think has sold out. O almost sold out. Almost sold out. Uh, where we open the glass house uh, for free to New Canaan residents. Again, please visit our website, theglasshouse.org, for information on that. Um, but there are a number of ways we, we work with the community. Certainly, I, I mentioned the uh, incredible presence of uh, 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 members of our team, uh, staff and guides uh, who are uh, from New Canaan and, and surrounding towns. Um, but we also do an after-school program for uh, kids 9 through 12. Um, at times, we do different kinds of projects with New Canaan high school students. Um, and so we're very much, uh, very much interested in continuing to uh, connect with, with all of you and with our community here. Um, much of the glass is original, not all. Uh, there was a, a famous incident where a wild turkey uh, flew in and uh, broke a, a plate of glass that was replaced. Um, and you know, this, this goes to some, some very interesting questions around historic preservation because um, clearly there are more efficient ways to, um, to work with a glass uh, facade now than there were in 1949. And so we're always trying to be, uh, on the one hand, as true as we can to the original design intent and materials and technologies of the day, and on the other to do things that, that make sense now. And especially as we're developing our strategy for repairing the sculpture gallery roof, uh, we're very much into, into those questions. Um, Johnson's archives were uh, divided into a number of places. We have a very uh, small bit here related to the glass house. Um, the original design drawings from the glass house are at the Museum of Modern Art, as well as other uh, important papers. Uh, Avery Library has quite a bit connected at Columbia with his professional practice. And he also gave some important works to the Getty, uh, to the Getty Research Institute. Uh, including his, uh, the letters he wrote to his mother from Europe during his travels in the 1920s, which have become very important in scholarship about Johnson. Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Well, we're fortunate because our, our buildings and grounds manager, Brendan Tobin, uh, uh, began working at the site as a high school student, began working with Marty uh, part-time, uh, and that was still during Philip and David's lifetime. So um, he really is the kind of historical memory of, of the landscape, uh, if you will, plus, of course, photographs uh, that we have. We 
we certainly do as, as much as we can. Um, the landscape also was changing, even if you see photographs from different periods, there were, there were changes. So there is no one way to maintain it. But we try to stay as true as we can to the <laughs> to the to the principles of of the site. Thank you so so Thank you so much, Henry, and thank you all for coming. We have um, refreshments in the back. You're very welcome to stay and talk with Henry and enjoy the refreshments for a little while. I look forward to continuing to explore and exploit the synergies that we both have as institutions in the uh, town looking after our cultural heritage and lifelong learning. I think this is the beginning of a, a an ex exciting partnership between the library and the glass house. Thank you so much, Henry. Thank you.